Good afternoon and welcome to the IMSC Algebraic Combinatoric Seminar. It's a great pleasure to have today my co-organizer as the speaker, Vishwanath. He's going to talk about saturation for uh, W-defined Littlewood-Richardson coefficient. This is part one of our two-part lecture series. Vishwanath. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Amri. Uh, so, uh, since I have uh, two lectures, I will just try and take it a little slower. Uh, so just feel free to stop me anytime um, if something I'm saying is not clear. Okay, uh, I'm reasonably audible, right? Amdi? Yes. Okay. Yes. <coughs> okay. So uh, the the setting for all of this is uh, the finite dimensional polynomial representations of uh, GMN. So by which I mean uh, homomorphism from uh, the group uh, GLNC to uh, GLDC for some finite D. So it's a homomorphism to some other um, uh, group of invertible matrices such that, so the polynomiality comes from saying that the entries of the, the image, so the polynomial phi G, its entries when written in terms of the entries of the input G are uh, polynomials. Okay, and uh, the what we want to study yeah, are the irreducibles typically, and uh, uh, in this case we know what they look like. The irreducibles are indexed by partitions lambda, with uh, at most n non-zero parts. Okay, where n is the n of the GLN, and uh, for instance, if one takes so I'll write all my partitions as uh, you know a sequence of n numbers, some of which could be zero. So the um, the representation with highest weight or the, with lambda corresponding to one zero 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 and so on is just the defining representation of uh, GLN <coughs> on on CN. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> when we have representations, we also want to study their characters. And uh, in this case, we define the character as follows. You just look at the, the subgroup of invertible diagonal matrices, uh, n cross n invertible matrices diagonal, and the character of the representation is defined as the trace of the action of the uh, diagonal matrices. So if uh, I take, for example, a diagonal matrix H, then the trace turns out to be the, what I'm calling phi sub D, character turns out to be symmetric in the n variables and uh, so it's a symmetric polynomial and in particular if you take v to be the representation v lambda then uh, this turns out to be exactly the sure polynomial which is s lambda okay <coughs> so here i i tabulated uh, some characters of uh, some polynomial representations of g n so as I said before, you have the defining representation, which is corresponds to lambda being the partition one zero zero. Sorry, uh, Vishwanath. Yes. Uh, it's your your voice is reducing. I think uh, there is. Uh, okay, okay. Ah, now it's better. You, yeah. Yeah, much better. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Is it okay, Kevin? Hello. Oh, it's much better, much better. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's actually very feeble for me. Uh, oh, I'm, at maximum, I, I'm at maximum volume. Uh -huh. yes. yeah, it started off very well, but uh, it has, I don't know, maybe your positioning is this thing. Uh, okay. Okay. How is this now? Better for much better for me. Okay, okay. Uh, no, not not quite not uh, not too much better. Not too much better. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me just try. What do you know this? Sorry. Hello. Uh, yeah. Now? 
Yeah, yeah, very good. Very good. Yeah, very good. It's very good. Very good. Thank it's you. It's much better. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So some problem with this external mic, I guess. Okay. So, um, okay. So here, uh, here I just try to tabulate some characters. So if we take the defining representation, for instance, which is one zero 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 as uh, lambda, then the character is just the trace of the matrix because the diagonal matrix will just act as itself. On C n, and the trace is of course just the sum of the diagonal vectors. Uh, if I take all ones, then that's the determinant. Uh, that's the representation is the determinant, the one-dimensional representation, and uh, so the trace is just the the action of that matrix itself, which is the product of diagonal values, product of the diagonal elements. And uh, here are two other uh, cases. So if I take uh, the representation with uh, the partition lambda, the highest weight, uh, looking like this with k ones and the rest zeros, then that corresponds to the polynomial representation, uh, the kth wedge of the, the standard representation, and this has uh, well, if you look at a typical diagonal matrix and ask how it acts on the kth wedge, then the eigenvalues will just be you know products of the eigenvalues or products of the diagonal elements taken k at a time and summed over all such k times. That's usually what we call the elementary uh, symmetric polynomial, the EK. And uh, sort of dually, if you take the partition with K000, then that's the K symmetric power. And there the eigenvalues are, are just, well, it's the same as the earlier thing with uh, the strict inequalities replaced by uh, less than or equal to. And that gives you what's called the complete homogeneous polynomial in the end variables, the kth complete. Uh, okay, so uh, now let me talk about semi-standard Young combo. So uh, these are combinatorial objects defined as follows. So if I give you a partition lambda uh, with at most n non-zero parts, so I'm going to fix n. So a semi-standard tableau is just a filling of the Young diagram of, of the partition lambda with numbers from one to n, subject to the conditions that the entries in the row increase weekly and the entries along the columns increase strictly. So here's an example of uh, semi-standard tableau of a standard representation. So it's just one zero zero zero, and so the the young diagram of the partition is just going to be uh, a single box in this case because it's just the partition one. And uh, fillings of that shape are well, you're allowed to put all numbers from one through n. And these two constraints here don't really uh, kick in because they really only uh, kick in if you have more than two entries, for example, so weekly increasing or strictly increasing doesn't really. So these are the n uh, semi-standard tableau on a single box. Okay, and uh, similarly for some of the other examples that I wrote the character out for, uh, if I take lambda to be k ones and all zeros, then that's the column. The, the corresponding lambda is just the column of size k. So the, the partition diagram is just drawn as follows. I, each part uh, is drawn along the rows. I draw those many uh, boxes in each row. So now here the, the semi-standard tableau on this shape will just be all possible fillings uh, of these k boxes subject to the strictly increasing condition on the columns, okay? which means that uh, I have exactly this condition here, I1 less than I2 less than IK, and I have to do this in all possible ways. And so if I write all possible semi-standard Young tableau, then, uh, well, okay, uh, sorry, let, let, I'll come to the character in just a minute. But, uh, so if I do the same thing with K000, then there it's a row instead of a column. And now all possible fillings here uh, are subject to the weekly increasing along the rows condition. And so that's, uh, all such numbers. And we we already saw that the characters were just, you know, you just had to take all possible k tuples subject to this condition, for example. And uh, the, the statement here is that the semi-standard Young tableau on a given shape lambda form what we call a combinatorial model of the lambda. Okay? And, uh, in well, there are many many precise uh, senses in which we want to think of it as a combinatorial model, but uh, 
for a start, I already observed the following that the character of a given representation can be read off from the from the collection of all semi-standard W of the given shape. Okay, and that's exactly uh, this statement here that the sure function, which is the character of the representation V lambda, is in fact nothing but the sum of well, there is a monomial here x to the t, which is I just take the products of all the xi's, the i's that I have filled in the different boxes of the tableau, all, all the entries to each I associate the variable xi, and I take the monomial weight x to the t, and I sum over all possible uh, semi-standard tableau and shape lambda. Okay, and and this is a classical fact that this is exactly the sure polynomial. And so the character of the representation can be obtained by just summing these monomial weights uh, uh, over all possible semi-standard lambda. So here is an example, uh, which is not a row or a column. So if I take the, the shape lambda to be 2, 1, 0, and so here I fix n to be 3, this, is, this corresponds to the so-called adjoint representation of the group GLPC. Now, if you write out on this shape 210 the possible list of uh, semi standard tableau, here's what uh, one obtains there are eight of them, and uh, with the fillings as shown, and the corresponding should polynomial, which is what you get by you know, summing the monomial weights on across these eight tableau, is what's written down. So, if we take x1, so the first tableau here is x1 square x2 is its monomial weight x1 square x3 is the weight of the next guy and so on. And one, one observes that there are two tableau here which give rise to the same weight x1, x2, x3. Okay, the tableau themselves are different, but the weight they give you at the end is in fact the same. Okay, now um, let me say a little bit more about the combinatorics of semi-standard tableaus. I said it's a, semi, it's a, a model it's a combinatorial model for the representation. So, uh, on the set of semi-standard Young tableau of shape lambda, one can define what are called the crystal operators. Okay, so there are uh, two of them: the what are called the raising and the lowering operators, the EI and the FI. And uh, well, uh, there are two of them for each i between one and n minus one. Okay, and their actions are as follows. If I take uh, EI of T, then what it does is it takes the, so it acts on tableau number. So it takes, uh, I mean, you, you have sort of have to look at the entries in the tableau and find a, a specific occurrence of I plus one. I mean, there may be many boxes with I plus ones in it. It, it picks out a certain I plus one and changes it to I. And similarly, fi picks out a box uh, labeled with an i and changes it to an i plus one. Of course, the the, the whole point is, uh, you know, how exactly are these chosen and so on. Uh, so this is what, broadly speaking, these operators do. Uh, or the uh, the other possibility is that they may not actually be defined on a given problem. So eit, for instance, may be undefined. Okay, and when it's not defined, we we tend to write uh, this as EIT is zero. So zero is just some symbol to say it's not defined. Okay. Now, uh, this is, there is an action on tableau. So I'm not getting into the definitions of the, the crystal operators themselves, but uh, it's important to note that it's not just, um, the crystal operators don't just act on tableau themselves. They more generally can be defined uh, and they act on words in the alphabet one through n. Okay. So I can define an action on words, um, not just on tableau. So I'll come to that in a, in a moment. So here are the key uh, properties of these crystal operators. So if I take my shape lambda, so for example, here is, here is the shape lambda, and I look at this, the super standard tableau on that shape. Okay, by which I mean you just fill all the ones in the first row, the twos in the second row, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is a special tableau on that shape. Then the one has the following two properties. 
that the super standard tableau is uh, killed by all the EIs. In other words, EI acting on this is not defined for all I. And secondly, if I take the super standard tableau and uh, act on it repeatedly by the, the various uh, lowering operators, the very, uh, various FIs, so this is over all possible Ks, over all possible choices of IJs. Uh, of course, if it's not defined, meaning if it's zero, you, you ignore it. Just take the, the ones that are defined. And that collection is exactly the collection of all semi-standard length tableau of shape. Okay, so these, these EIs and FIs, these crystal operators, have the following two important properties. There is a, there is a certain special tableau. In fact, this is the unique tableau with this property one, that EI kills, all the EIs kill it. And secondly, that uh, every other tableau can be obtained from this special one by repeated applications of the lowering operators. Um, okay, now, <coughs> so here's, uh, here is the action of the um, FIs on the, the eight tableau that I wrote out for the shape lambda equals to one. So uh, if I take, so this is the super standard tableau. So this is what we call D zero lambda. So here lambda is the shape two comma one comma C. And remember N equals D. So uh, if I apply F1, for example, to this top guy, so remember F1 is supposed to change a one to a two. Okay. Uh, so there are two ones here. It picks out in this case, if one follows the definition and so on, the F1 picks out this one and changes that to a two. Okay. So I have one, one, two under F1 goes to the tableau one, two, two. And similarly, if I take F2 on the other side, then uh, F2 will take uh, one, one, two, and suppose change a two to a three. In this case, there's only a single two here. So that two changes to a three. So it goes to one, one, three, and so on. So you can sort of see that at every step. So the, the blues are the F1s, and the green arrows are the F2s. Okay, so again, let's check this one. So this F1, it has changed uh, this one to a two, for example. Another F1 here will change this one to a two. So this one here became a two. Similarly, the F2s have changed twos to threes in all cases. So here, the two here changes to a three. Uh, F2 again will change, let's see which one, this two here changes to a three and so on. Okay, so that's that's what the F Fs are doing. And this, the top guy, the super standard guy is enough to generate all the other uh, W. Okay, so um, I said something about words rather than tableau as being somehow the more, um, you know, EIs and FIs can actually act on words. So here's the, the same picture that I drew before, but written out in terms of what are called the uh, reverse reading words of tableau. Okay, so these are usually called the reverse row words. So what are, what are these reverse row words? So the top guy here is 112. Okay. Um, how do I get that from the tableau? Well, I read the tableau as follows. I, I read it from right to left and from top to bottom. <coughs> okay. So uh, it's reverse. Ask? Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. So is this uh, 112 is a kind of a lowest weight vector in the in the Which one? This one on top. Uh, yeah. It's a highest weight vector. Ah, yes, to it, Victor. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And the one at the bottom will be the lowest. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank I you. mean, it's the lowest weight in some sense. So these are not vectors at the moment. It's just some uh, indices. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So how do we get these these words themselves from the tableau? It's as follows. I'm supposed to read the tableau as follows. I read it from right to left and top to bottom. Okay, so this is the rule. So let's uh, look through all of them. So when I read the super standard guy from right to left, top to bottom, I get one one two. And when I read this fellow, it's one one three. Uh, let's do one more. This is two one three. If I if I look at this uh, tableau here, 
So let's just see that that was exactly the case. So for example, this was 213, this was 113, this is 112, okay, and so on. All the others are obtained in the same fashion. So you just, each tableau can be replaced by a word, and the E's and the F's in some sense are, are actually defined on words, all possible words in uh, one group. Okay, now uh, this point of view with words has the following, uh, I mean, once you expand your worldview to, to words rather than tableau, then the, it opens up the possibility of constructing other combinatorial models, which are not tableau, but rather more general words. Okay, so there are other word models for V lambda, if you wish. Uh, what do I mean by that? So you, you need to sort of start with similar ingredients as in the tableau case. So if I start with V0 lambda, so instead of the super standard tableau or the super standard word, it's fine to start with any other word whose weight is lambda. Okay, the weight in this case of the word is just the number of ones, the number of twos, the number of threes, and so on that it has. Okay, so in this case, uh, so in this example here, the word I started out with was one, one, two. So there are two ones and a single two. Okay, so I don't need to start with this guy, one, one, two. It's fine to start with other words of this weight, which have an additional property, uh, which is the following, which is that it should it should be killed by all the EIs. It should have the same property that the super standard word had. Okay. Now this being killed by all the EIs or being not defined on the EIs is equivalent to the following uh, condition. It says when you write out the word V0 lambda, every left subword of V0 lambda should contain more ones than twos, than threes, than fours, and so on. Okay. So each each subword you you truncate. Uh, it at any point and look at how many ones, twos, threes there are, you should always have more ones than twos than threes. So such a word is usually called a ballot sequence or a dominant word or a lattice permutation and so on. So let us uh, let me just show you this in this case. So uh, I could start not with one, one, two, but rather with say one, two, one. Okay, so this is, here is another valid choice. The, the total weight is the same, number of ones and twos. Is the right number two ones and a single two okay so two ones means it's uh, i think of a partition with uh, the first row having two boxes and a single two okay and uh, if i start with this word then i can do the pretty much the same thing i keep applying f's and f1s and f2s and so on all possible ways turns out that the lowest word that i get in this case is the word two three three okay and so the theorem here is the is the following. It says that this again forms a combinatorial model for this representation in the sense that if I start with this particular word and I apply all possible Fs, I collect together all the words generated in this way. And uh, that collection is stable under the E's and the Fs, okay, number one. And secondly, and this is the interesting thing, if I take the words that I get here, and I compute their monomial weights. I take that x power w's that I talked about earlier, and I sum over all such words. Then it it again gives me the sure format. Again gives me the character of the representation. So, for example, here uh, I didn't write out the remaining words, but if you if you dig this, uh, you would get another word model if you wish for the representation. If you, if you add up all these weights, it would again work out to be the sure format. Okay, and in this particular case, this, this model is what's called the contra tableau, the words which come from what are called contra tableau, which is uh, not tableau written out in this way, but rather tableau which are like this. Okay, but anyway, that's, that's uh, let me not get into that right now. So all I want to say is that you, you can pretty much talk about um, you know, almost any word model uh, all you need is for a starting point, you just need this highest weight guy. And from that, you can just keep applying Fs, and what you get will certainly be a model for that particular representation, for that irreducible representation. Okay, so now I, I uh, want to talk about tensor products and word concatenations. Uh, so if I have two word models, so let's say I, I have two sets B1 and B2, both of which are 
let's say stable under the EIs and the FIs. Okay, so let me say B one and B two are E and F stable. EI FI stable. Okay, now if I uh, uh, okay, so given two such collections of words, what I can do is to form what's called B one star B two. Which is a new collection whose elements are just concatenations of uh, words W1 star W2. W1 comes from the first set, W2 comes from the second set. And what's a concatenation? Well, a concatenation of words is just the following you just put them together. So 3, 2, 1, 3 concatenated with 1, 2, 2, for example, is just 3, 2, 1, 3, 1, 2. And the key property here is that the monomial weight of a concatenation, if I compute x to the W1 star W2, so recall x to the w1 was just so for instance for this word the weight is just there are two three so it's x3 square there is a single one and a single two so this x1 x2 x3 square is the, is the weight of this word this word is x1 x2 square so multiplying the, the monomial weights is the same as computing the, the monomial weight of the concatenation because the number of ones will add the twos will add and so, on. so this is the key property that product of the monomial weights is exactly the weight of the concatenation and uh, the, the well as a consequence one one obtains the following that if you start with the word model b of b0 lambda which is a model for the representation b lambda a combinatorial model for b lambda and another one which is a model for b mu then these word concatenations will give you a combinatorial model for the tensor product. Okay, and why is that? Because just by comparing characters, at least the character matches up with what we want. The, the, the character of B, by which I mean you add up all the monomial weights of concatenations. Because of this property here, that it's the product, you can sort of factor it out and into, into two pieces. And that's just because of the fact that you started with combinatorial models for the, the two initial representations, this sum will work out to be this guy. The second sum is just by mu of x. Okay, so the product uh, of the two characters is exactly the character of the tensor product. So that's 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 exactly the character of the lambda tensor product. Okay, now Here's the other fact which requires to be checked, but it's uh, easy to do that this collection, this concatenations are still stable under the actions of the EIs and the FIs. Okay, so this uh, now the, this new set B forms a combinatorial model for the tensor product. And uh, the the decomposition theorem. So this is uh, this is somehow the the key uh, step which allows us to. You know, compute tensor product multiplicities in a combinatorial fashion. So here's a more general version. It says if I have a finite set of words which are stable under the EIs and the FIs for all i, then this, this set B decomposes into a disjoint union uh, of, well, B of B, remember, just means I have to take all, I mean, B should be, uh, the, the small B here is an element of B plus, which is by definition, all of those elements killed by the EIs. So this B is like a sort of a highest weight, right? It's killed by the EIs. And B of B, remember, the definition was that this is uh, what you get by applying a repeat Fs. So I keep applying Fs to this B, and take the collection of words that I get in this term. Okay, so if I have a finite collection of words which are stable under the E's and the Fs, then that collection decomposes into a disjoint union of such guys, and uh, as a consequence, the character of B. So, so now each of these is remember a combinatorial model for an irreducible representation. Okay, and what representation is this? Well, if I if I have a B like this, I just look at its weight. I I see what the weight of that B is, and that will tell me what my lambda is. That's my highest. Weight. Okay, so this this fact here, the composition of words. Uh, gives me a corresponding fact about representations, which is that if this B were the character of some representation B, then 
that representation B decomposes as the direct sum of the following irreducibles. It's B of weight of B as B varies over these, these elements of B plus. Okay, so this is the this is sort of just the abstract uh, decomposition theorem. So, uh, so in terms of parts and so on, this is due to a little one. So here's uh, so here's restating the same thing, but for the special case of um, uh, tensor products. So uh, recall, I said if I have a tensor product of two representations, I know one combinatorial model for it, which is just concatenations. So if I have two representations, v lambda and v mu, look at the concatenations of words and use the decomposition theorem to decompose this collection into a disjoint union of, of, uh, of, of uh, words generated by elements uh, small b. So here's the decomposition theorem itself. It says v lambda tensor v mu is a direct sum of v of weight of b as b ranges over elements of b plus. Okay, now what is this element B plus? What is this, this set B plus by definition? It is all elements in the in this set of concatenations, which can uh, which are killed by all the EIs. Okay, so B in B plus. So B plus recall just means I have to take all B in B, which are killed by the EIs. So that's my definition. Now it turns out that any such B, I mean, in general, such a B is a concatenation of a word from the first guy with a word from the second set. But because of this additional condition that EIB is zero for all I, it's easy to show that B must have this very special form. That B must, well, the first component, the, the thing which comes from the first set, must just be the highest weight word, which is B0. Okay. And the second guy, of course, can be anything. It's, it's in general an arbitrary word coming from the, the set B of B0 mu. But of course, the, the concatenation must be in B plus. So that's the, that's the condition. Okay, and uh, this, is, uh, this is more or less what's uh, called the little bit Richardson rule, um, which says that if I want to decompose a tensor product of two representations, then the, the irreducible piece V gamma appears with a certain coefficient, C lambda mu gamma, where this coefficient is exactly the, well, in some sense, the number of Bs for which the weight is gamma. Okay, So it's the number of words W coming from this set, B of B0 mu, such that after concatenation, pre-concatenation with B0 lambda, that concatenation lives in B plus. Okay, so that's the, the condition. And further, since I want that particular term to contribute towards B gamma, I want to also impose this additional condition that lambda plus the weight of W should be equal to gamma. Okay, so this is the little wood Richardson rule. Um, so well, at the moment, there are, there are sort of many things to unravel, for example. So what you know is where the words live, the words you're looking for, they, they live. For example, you can take semi-standard young tableau of shape mu. They form one possible combinatorial model for the representation. So I, for example, I, I look for words W among the semi-standard young tableau words of shape mu, such that when I concatenate that word on the left by the super standard word of shape lambda, the result is what I call a ballot sequence. The result is in B plus. And further, the number of ones, twos, threes in the concatenation is exactly the, the number of ones, twos, threes in B plus. Okay, so this, this condition here saying that the word is then shifted by, um, um, you know, when concatenated from the left by lambda gives me an element of B plus. So sometimes we, we call these, uh, lambda shifted so these are called lambda shifted or lambda dominant words w okay so w itself is not dominant but once you shift it by lambda then it becomes one so here's uh, here's the same uh, uh, table from before 
so this is my uh, okay ah uh, okay so these are again the the very same eight words that we saw in the the earlier example okay so the the eight words are in blue so these are the tableau words 112 113 2 and 3 and so on so here are the eight tableau words which uh, uh, form so the mu that i'm taking is 2 comma 1 so Uh, these are the eight words and now i i want to take lambda which is 1 1 okay. so i i want to take uh, i'm sorry i want to take lambda to be the the partition 2 and and all other parts are zeros the super standard tableau of shape lambda so the thing that that, that i call b0 lambda is therefore the tableau where i put ones in all all the first row twos in the second row and so on here i can only put ones So here B zero lambda is just the word one one, and what you see here in this picture are these eight words which are sort of pre-multiplied by this one one. Okay, so I multiply one one on the left, and then I have to look through these eight words, and in order to compute the tensor product decomposition, what I need to do is to find out which among these eight is now dominant after hitting on the left by lambda or shifting on the left. and it turns out that those are exactly only these four words which are circled in green these are the only four uh, dominant lambda dominant words they are dominant after shifting so what that means is that so here are those very same four words written out uh, all ones and two one one two two three and so on so i've just written out those four words and i i sort of from for each of these words you need to figure out what the partition looks like Again, what is the partition? So I said you have to look at b of weight of that element b. Okay. So for each of the b, so these are the b's and these are the weights of b. Okay. So in this case, there are four ones and a two. So that's this partition: four ones and a two, meaning and a, there's a single two. So there are four ones and a single two. This says that there are three ones. There is a single two and a single three. And so Okay, so you you figure out what the weights look like by by uh, counting the number of ones, twos, and threes, and finally you can write out the tensor product decomposition in this manner. Okay, so this says that if I decompose the representation B of two comma zero, so which uh, remember I said is sim two for example of the defining representation tensor with So this, which I said was the adjoint representation, so all of this is with GL three. So sim two tensor, the adjoint representation, decomposes into the direct sum of the four representations, four irreducibles with these highest ones. Okay, so that's what you conclude from the literal representation. Okay, so uh, let me get to demesure crystals. Um, So what we're going to eventually do is somehow refine the little bit of some rule by introducing certain wild group elements into into the picture. Okay. Now uh, the wild group of GLN turns out to be the symmetric group SN, and this group SN acts on the set of all semi-standard young tableau of any given shape. Okay, so there's an action of SN. Uh, more generally, you can also define an action of this group, for example, on the uh, you know starting with any other word instead of the semi standard tableau model you can take any other model you wish for the representation and there will still be an action of sn on on the words of that model okay or if you wish to think in terms of weights uh, here's what it does the the action of sigma in the sen sigma acts on a tableau in the following manner the weight of the resultant is nothing but If you know the weight of T, then you you sort of act sigma on that weight. Okay. So th this is the weight space in which the the action is. Okay. So here's uh, just make this full screen. Okay. So here's the thing. So simple reflections uh, for S N uh, generate S N. Simple reflections are just the adjacent transpositions one two two three three four and so on. And uh, So what I've done now in this figure is uh, it's more or less the same guys that you saw earlier, but I removed the two things in the middle, only kept the six uh, tableaux there on the periphery of the diagram. Okay, 
and these six tableau turn out to be the following. If, so this is the super standard tableau of shape lambda. And if you apply the simple reflection S1 to this tableau, then it maps it to the tableau 1 to 2. Okay, and similarly, each of these other guys. So it, uh, again, the definition of the simple reflection on tableau, I, I, I'm not getting into, but at least one can check that at the level of weights, everything is as expected. For instance, this 112 has weight x1 square x2. And if you apply the simple reflection S1, which is supposed to change uh, 1 and 2, this new guy has uh, weight, well, there's a single 1 and 2, 2. So this is weight x1, x2 square. Okay, so observe that this weight x1, x2 square is obtained from x1 square x2 by, uh, up, by switching 1 and 2. Similarly, this one here is x, uh, x1 square x3, which is exactly what you would get starting from here if you changed 2 and 3, if you interchange 2 and 3. Okay, and so on. So you can see that these six tableau that I've drawn here are at least their weights are exactly what you would expect okay. when you apply the corresponding simple reflections S1 and S2. Okay, so uh, so what I've done, I've, I've taken the, the the tableau model, but only kept these sort of extremal guys. Now, uh, more generally, so here's the general definition of a MSU crystal. Uh, this is this definition is going to be important for. Uh, what I'll say later on. So given an element of Sn and given a partition mu, uh, we do the following. We first write this element sigma as S1, Si1, Si2, Sik. So we write uh, a reduced expression for it or a minimal uh, expression in terms of the simple reflections, okay? minimal length expression. So you fix one such minimal length expression for the while group element sigma. For the permutation in sigma, and we do the following now. So we define what we call Demesio mu comma sigma to be the following collection. You start with the super standard tableau T not mu, and uh, so all this is all the action here is taking place inside the collection of all semi-standard tableau of shape mu. You start with the super standard guy, and you apply these operators fi, the lowering operators fi, but the catch here is that you're only allowed to apply them in the same order in which this reduced expression is written. Okay, meaning if I have the simple reflections corresponding, to, suppose my sigma is say S1, S2, then I'm only allowed to look at all possible uh, words in the fi's which look like some power of f1 followed by some power of f2 acting on the super standard. Okay. So in particular, this what's not allowed is if I take say F2, F1 of the super standard, this would not be allowed. Okay. If, if sigma is just S1, S2. So then, so these are the only ones which are allowed. And, you know, if I take it in the other order, then I'm not allowed. Okay, and of course, I'm, I'm going to allow my MI, some of them to be zero also, if need. Okay, so uh, what I'm saying is collect together all these uh, tableau or more generally words, which result by applying the FIs only in this designated sequence. Okay. You will get some collection of tableau, in, it's a subset of the set of all semi standard tableau. Of course, this collection is not going to be stable under both EIs and FIs. It turns out it's stable under the EIs, but it's not going to be stable under the FIs. Okay, so it's it's not a it's not a crystal in the sense of being something that's stable under E's and F's. But uh, let's look at what sorts of objects one gets in in our example. So if we take the set dem mu sigma, so these are these what I call Demi crystals. So uh, these are the various possibilities. So I, I take the elements identity. So sigma here is identity or S2, um, S1, S2, S1, and S1, S2. So I, I, I have five of the six elements written out here. And for each of them, the, the Demesure crystal, that is the subset that I generate by following this description. Okay. 
So that collection is what's drawn here. So if sigma is the identity, then of course I only get the top guy, only the super standard. So if it is S1, then I get the super standard and the guy which is obtained by applying an F1. Sigma is S2, I get super standard and the one that's obtained by applying F2. Uh, if I take S1, S2, for example, so I have super standard, then this is F1 applied to that, F2 applied to that. This is F1, F2, and this is F1 square. F2. So, so, sorry, each of these is an additional F1. Okay. So, this, this W that is written here, for example, is just F1 square, F2 acting on the super standard. Okay, and observe that's allowed because I'm applying you know, it in the correct order. I'm, I'm applying F1s and then f And similarly, this is the other the other guy, sort of the symmetrical equivalent. And uh, lastly, so there's a sixth element, which is the longest element of the wild group. And when I apply that longest element of the wild group and look at the Demasio crystal that I get out of it, it turns out, give me everything. And so the Demasio crystals that I have defined have the following nice properties that uh, if I take the Demasio crystal of the identity, it is a singleton. The longest element W0 gives me everything. And sort of in between, I have this nice partial order relation, which is that sigma is smaller than tau in the partial order. Uh, in this case, it's the Bruha order on the symmetric group. Then the Demasiur crystal for sigma is contained inside the Demasiur crystal of tau. Okay, in other words, this if you think of W as a poset under the Bruha order, and on the other hand, I have subset. So this is a power set of the set of, uh, of uh, semi-standard tableau. So subsets of semi-standard tableau uh, ordered under inclusion. This map is, a, is an order preserving map of the sets. Okay, and this is the other important property. I, for the identity, I get just a singleton and for W0, I get everything. And here's the important property that so why, why does one want to define these objects? Well, they turn out to have some representation here at the beginning. Just like if you took all semi-standard tableau and computed the sum of their monomial weights, you would get the Schur polynomial. Similarly, if you computed the sum of monomial weights only for the elements in the, the Demasur module, uh, sorry, in the, in the Demasur crystal, what it gives you is the character of what's called the Demasur module. Okay. The Demasur module here, is a certain submodule of, of the, the whole module we knew. Uh, it's defined as follows. You take a vector, a non-zero vector of weight equal to sigma mu. Okay, where sigma is the, the file group element we are looking at. So sigma mu is, of course, that extremal weight vector. Okay, so we, we sort of drew these in, you know, I circled them in, in yellow. So all these things with yellow circles around them are sort of the extremal weights. They are sigma acting on the, the weight mu. Now, uh, you take a vector in that in that weight space. Uh, it's a one-dimensional weight space. And you sort of look at the upper triangular matrices. Okay, they are a subgroup of GL and C. And the uh, submodule, the, the UN submodule of V mu generated by this external weight vector, that's called the Demasur module. Okay? Turns out that this Demasur crystal is, in some sense, a combinatorial model for the Demasur model. Okay, so now we are we are almost ready to state the, the key object uh, that uh, I will say more about in the next lecture. But here's the here's the definition. So recall that the Littlewood Richardson coefficient is defined as follows. So I take the number of semi-standard tableau or tableau words such that they are lambda shifted dominant. Okay? I mean, I pre multiply by the lambda word, the super standard lambda word. What results is a dominant word. Okay? And of course, such that the weight condition, they, the, the weight works out exactly to be the gamma that you have used. Okay? So, this was the definition of, of the little Richardson coefficient. But now I'm going to replace the set of all semi standard tableau by just the subset Demasur mu sigma. So this is now only looking at, so I fix a sigma, and now I ask uh, how many words in the Demasur crystal 
them mu sigma satisfies the same property as above. Such, in other words, how many its are Ws are there in them mu sigma such that they are lambda shifted dominant, and their weight of lambda plus that is exactly. So this this number we'll call the W refined little Richardson coefficient. Uh, the obvious property is that this, of course, less than or equal to the little Richardson coefficient. So here are the easy properties. If I put W equals, if you put sigma equals W naught, if you take uh, W naught, then recall I said the Demesure crystal is the whole thing. So in that case, of course, E lambda mu gamma will just give me the entire little Richardson coefficient. Uh, uh, sort of on the other extreme, if I take sigma to be the identity, then the little, the, the sort of refined little Richardson coefficient is either one or zero. It's one. Exactly, if lambda plus mu equals gamma, and it is zero otherwise. And sort of in between, we have the same kind of partial order relation. We said that if sigma is less than or equal to tau in the in the true order, then the uh, the Demesure crystals are also subsets of each other. So it's clear from the definition that the, the corresponding LR coefficient will also be bounded above by the LR coefficient of tau. Okay. So in fact, there's a little bit more that one can say that not just that less than or equal to tau in true order, but rather the true order on double crystals. Okay, uh, I'll come to that in a second, but here's the, um, here, okay, so I should say that at, at this moment, this is just some, uh, you know, rather unmotivated sort of definition, which is, I just take the full little Richardson coefficient and say that instead of taking all words which contribute to it, let me only restrict my attention to the words which come from a given Demesure crystal. Okay. So some sort of arbitrary restriction that I'm imposing at this point, but turns out that this, this actually has some representation theoretic meaning, which is really why we want to study these in the first place. And the meaning is as follows. So uh, here's what one could do, sort of analogous to the definition of Demesure modules that I just gave. So let's look at the, the tensor product V lambda tensor V mu. And inside this, Look at this vector, v small v sub lambda, which means it's a vector of weight lambda. So it's the highest weight vector of the first piece, v lambda. And the second guy, v sigma mu, is a vector, it's an extremal weight vector of v mu, which means it lives in that weight space sigma mu of the second model. So I take these two vectors, I look at their tensor product, which lives inside uh, capital V lambda tensor v mu, and say, let's take the submodule, the GLNC submodule generated by this one. Okay, it's going to be some subspace, some submodule of the tensor product. And of course, since it's a GLNC submodule, it decomposes into reducibles. And it's a theorem of Joseph. It says that this module decomposes as follows each V gamma appears exactly C lambda mu gamma sigma times where this is exactly the number, the refined LR coefficient that I just did. So this is the sigma refined LR coefficient. Okay, so the sigma refined LR coefficients are exactly the, the multiplicities or the reducibles which occur in these uh, special submodules of the tensor product. Okay, and uh, th this is one way of thinking about them. There's another way where instead of talking about GLN submodules, you can talk about uh, UN submodules, sort of the, the Demesure is part of the story. And this says the following, uh, you look at, you know, take the Demesure module V sigma of mu. And so a Demesure module, by the way, is only a module for uh, UN. So remember when, when I'm doing this, I'm only talking about the set of upper triangular matrices as my group. So V sigma mu is, uh, a UN module, so that's what I said here. It's a UN module, and I look at that tensor V lambda. Okay, this is just a singleton, uh, just a one dimensional space. So, this tensor product is still a UN module, okay, and this admits a filtration. So, it turns out that there is a filtration of this space by uh, Demesure modules. Okay, so when I say it, it admits a filtration by Demesure modules, what I mean is sort of like a Jordan Holder thing. I have a, a, a filtration whose successive quotients 
are exactly are isomorphic to them. Okay, and so the Mazur modules means they are indexed by some wild group elements and by some gamma j's. And so theorem due to sort of Joseph, Matthew, Polo, Van der Kallen, and various versions that the the gamma j's, the ones which appear here, the number of j's for which gamma j equals the given gamma gamma that you wanted, that's also given by this same refined LR coefficient. Okay, so this is sort of the representation theoretic um, um, sort of. Well, it's it's the representative motivation for wanting to study these numbers. Okay, uh, so now, Vishwana. Yeah. Uh, can you go to the previous slide? Yeah. So, uh, no, the next one. Yeah. So, do you know precisely which uh, gamma j appears here? Uh, do we know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's exactly what the theorem tells you. No, no. I mean uh, tau j's. No, 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 no. That I mean, there there is a way of sort of saying which tau j's are you know, correspond to. So for each gamma, you can also compute the tau's. Uh, so there is an algorithm that. Uh, you know, so this this is also in the path uh, point of view, also due to Little Mom, uh, Lakshmi Bai, and Nadia, and they sort of give an algorithm for computing the tau's. Um, but it's not. Uh, I mean, sort of. Uh, it's only an algorithm. It's a, one can't really say it to them. So it's the gammas that we sort of understand so easily. So your, your, I guess, you know, the import of your question partly is that the same gamma may appear with different types. Uh, yes, yeah. Right. But what we finally count is only you know, how many times a given gamma appears. And that, that final tally is given by this refined Okay. Thank you. Okay, so now coming to uh, the, the, the title of my talk in some sense. So the saturation conjecture. So when we have little Richardson-like coefficients, so this refinement here, what we can do is to sort of ask the same saturation question that uh, Knudsen and Tao uh, answered for the, the full little Richardson coefficient. So here's the statement of the, the saturation theorem you now. Which is that if I have three partitions, lambda, mu, and gamma, of, of the utmost n parts, and if for some k greater than or equal to one, I know that the little root Richardson coefficient k lambda, k mu, k gamma is strictly positive, then I know the same fact for just c lambda mu gamma. Okay, so this positivity for a given k ensures positivity for k equals one. And now we ask the same question. What about you know the saturation for the W refined LR coefficients, which is if I also now also fix a sigma and ask if C k lambda k mu k gamma of sigma is positive, then is the same true for uh, k equals one? Okay. And uh, the immediate thing is that this certainly holds for the two extreme cases. If sigma is the identity, or if sigma equals W naught. Well, if sigma equals w naught, this is just the, the full saturation conjecture because there the defined coefficients equal the, the whole uh, LR coefficient. If sigma is identity, then recall I said it's it's either one or zero. It's one exactly when uh, lambda plus mu equals gamma, and that's however the same as saying k lambda plus k mu equals k gamma. So if it holds for some k, then you cancel k off. It also holds for k. So in these two extremes, this certainly holds the saturation conjecture. And so finally, here is our uh, the statement of our theorem, uh, which is that uh, so this is Magendra and Raghavan and myself. So uh, we say the following that uh, if you have partitions lambda mu gamma, then saturation holds, provided sigma has a special form. Okay. And the special form is in terms of permutation pattern avoidance. So sigma should either be a 312 avoiding permutation or a 231 avoiding permutation. Okay. And uh, so I'll, I'll just say what they are in a moment, but uh, for those who already know what this is, so observe that the, the, the longest element of the Vailguru, which is just the 
in a written and one line notation it's just uh, the, the numbers 1 through n in descending order that permutation avoids you know both of these it doesn't uh, it avoids 312 as well as 231 so in in some sense therefore this is a generalization of the saturation so that you we recover that as a spectral case of this but uh, so let me just Sort of finish by saying what pattern avoidance. So this is the this is a statement of theorem. And my plan uh, is just a quick question. Yeah. Do you expect this to fail for uh, when it's not avoiding these patterns? Uh, okay. Good question. So we sort of ran a lot of sage uh, for uh, uh, SL5 and so on, GL5, uh, without really finding a good answer. So we we don't know if you know if you fail, but um, so, I mean, these two conditions are sort of there. This is the case in which we can prove it because uh, so we, we, we are sort of using results of Stanley and others where, you know, th these are somehow known to be the cases where uh, the Gelfand Zetlin polytope is very simple you know, and so on and so forth. So it comes from there. So there is also, a, I mean, one can also look at, um, you know, permutations which are sort of products of these kinds, meaning you know, if, if you write it as, say, some W1 cross W2 cross W3, sort of like a young subgroup, an element of a young subgroup in which each of the components is of one or the other type, 312 or 331 avoiding, then again it holds. Uh, but for a very general, most general case, it's not clear what, what works. But we didn't find any counter examples. Thanks. So, so let me just say what pattern avoidance in permutations means. Uh, it, here's the thing, you write out your permutation in one line notation. So just a sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma n. So here's, uh, you say that sigma contains 3, 1, 2. If the following happens, if you find three numbers, so here's here's the diagram. So you, you draw a sigma in one line notation. Uh, you write sigma in one line notation and you should be able to find three numbers uh, which are as follows, you know, the first guy is the largest of the three, the second is the smallest of the three, and the, the third fellow is the medium guy, the one in the middle. Okay, so this is like saying three, one, and two, so the relative order of these three numbers is exactly the relative order of these three entries in your uh, permutation. So here is an example, if I take six, seven, two, one, four, three, five, then if you look at these three numbers, six, two, and four, they their relative order is three, one, and two. Right, six is the largest fellow, uh, two is the smallest one, and four is the medium guy. So this permutation contains three one two. In fact, there are many other ways in which it contains three one two. For example, you can also look at seven one three. That's also uh, three numbers which are of that type. Okay, and you say that it avoids three one two if it doesn't contain three one two. So that's what pattern avoidance means. Similarly, for two three one, uh, you know you. It's the same thing. The small, medium, large. It should have the same relative order as um, the the other guy. So this is the formal definition to say that one permutation contains another of smaller length. If uh, sorry, of smaller size. If you can find a subsequence when you write sigma in one line notation, you can find a subsequence of uh, entries sigma i one, sigma i two, sigma i k, which are in the same relative order as tau one, tau two, tau three. Okay. And uh, let me just, this is my last slide, close by saying that, uh, uh, you know, pattern avoidance somehow is, a, it's a very, very rich field with uh, some hundreds of papers uh, in various contexts. So, for example, the, from a combinatorial counting perspective, the number of uh, 312 avoiding patterns, for instance, is a Catalan number. Uh, the same is actually true for 231. In fact, for any of the other, uh, you know, for all the six permutations of it in S3 the number is always the Catalan number. So then there are these other results like the Stanley Wolf conjecture which say, you know, uh, which tell you how uh, the number of permutations which avoid a fixed pattern, how that grows with n. Uh, then sort of from a more geometric perspective, sort of this very famous paper of Lakshmi Bai and Sandhya and uh, also earlier work of Lakshmi Bai which characterizes smoothness of Schubert varieties in terms of uh, pattern avoidance you know, it's a, it appears an algorithm combinatorial. It's more or less a ubiquitous sort of thing in, in many different things. Um, in our case, it, it comes up in what we are trying to do, 
because as i said those are the special permutations in which the the elfand zettlin polytope has a especially nice one and beams okay so i'll stop for today my plan for next week is to sort of uh, talk about the basic idea of knutson and tau's proof in terms of hives and say how you sort of put this extra w this extra sigma into that hive model and uh, then more or less it you know it follows from uh, just like slight, slight changes to their argument nothing particularly difficult okay okay so uh, let's thank vishwanath for this uh, really nice exposition you can unmute your mics or very nice talk and uh, now let's go to questions Just feel free to uh, unmute your mic yeah vishwanath yeah. uh, one question uh, so uh, okay so the demazur module of course so one can think of it geometrically also as the uh, what your sections or you let take the appropriate uh, schubert variety and you get you apply okay. your sigma lambda and you get that is the character of that module so when yeah. you tensor it and when, and when you tensor it with this gln module on the left ha huh. yeah that's what you are doing right you are looking at uh, that gln module v lambda and you are tensoring it with no no not with a model, a, not just that single, uh, single one, dimensional. one dimensional oh only that one dimensional oh, oh yeah so only that only so that is uh, okay okay so it, uh, that is again a demazur module right because it that is, is it. just the highest weight that you know that is the identity wala demazur module okay. so they are both uh, b modules and you are yeah. you are tensoring them and thinking of it again as or what upper triangle matrix is you are not okay so that continues to be is the uh, so that module uh, if i uh, uh oh uh, since you are only looking at the lambda uh, the one dimensional b mod mod you are looking at that and then that is what you are tensoring it with your with your v lambda v the whatever w lambda sigma lambda yes. with sigma mu sigma mu you are tensoring those two you are tensoring so it is sigma. like is it uh, v sigma mu you are tensoring with this character right you are tensoring v sigma mu yeah. with this character yes yeah. with, with this, this character that, now yeah. that continues to build so that continues to be a module for that uh, schubert variety it's it's a module yeah, but you can take that the, character take the uh, it's a mod no so i'm saying if i look at uh, that character uh, namely lambda plus uh, uh, sigma of mu so if i look at that particular character yeah, yeah. lambda plus sigma mu and lambda i look Lam mm. I can take that character and I can look at the cohomology of that Schubert variety with respect to this character. Uh, uh, correct. I can talk of that. But is uh, that is still a dominant weight? Uh, no, lambda plus sigma mu may not be dominant. Yeah. So then. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Lambda plus sigma mu. No, but uh, when you say sigma mu, you are going to take. Uh, you are going to apply. all possible uh, you are going to write out sorry you you write a ex expression for uh, your longest word uh, you write an expression for your sigma and then you are going to pick out uh, all things you including identity you will pick out right uh, i yes so you you don't need to write the longest word so i guess not the longest word just the uh, word corresponding sigma. to sigma yes right. and then you, you are going to apply all these fi all these operators yes. and pick out all the extremal guys corresponding to that correct yes yes, yes. that yeah. is what your other object is but clearly that uh, uh, oh so the only possible highest weight there definitely is of course lambda plus mu yes that is certainly there That's but right. there are probably other highest weights also which come in uh, yes yes and that that's exactly and what that is exactly okay okay what you are counting so so i mean when you think of it the uh, purely in terms of uh, the the demazur picture hmm. see there it is not a module for the whole gln it correct only for the, the b module only for the borel correct and uh, so then i mean there is no complete reducibility or anything anymore so correct. what you right so what uh, this this joseph this filtration so what they call hmm. excellent filtration hmm. is to sort of see what what best you can do next so if you if you try and find a filtration Of this range module, 
foods such that the successive quotients are things you have some handle on. So the okay. successive quotients must be isomorphic to them, zero modules, which are okay. some nice uh, class of B modules. Right? Okay. So, okay. so that is the that seems to be the philosophy here. So yeah. this other thing where you you want to work with GLN modules, mm. then you can take so this this very same thing that you just said, which is uh, this character v lambda tensor with the demisure module. Mm. The the GLN submodule generated by this guy mm. is what we are looking at. So the what I call K of whatever. Okay. See there are I mean there are two ways of defining the K. So, mm. so uh, sorry, skip. Yeah, sorry. So this K that I defined here yes. as the GLN sub generated by the single vector is actually also the GLN submodule generated by that uh, V lambda tensor V sigma of me. You can also you can also uh, say it is yeah. this because this demisure module. I mean this 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 right hand side V lambda tensor V sigma of mu is contained in in the G uh, GLN module generated by. This. Correct. Correct. Right. So you can also define it like that. So in some sense, this uh, this GLN picture is like. You take this B module that you are interested in, and you sort of make it into a GLN module by just uh, taking the submodule it generates. Correct. Okay. Okay. And uh, so some of the that doesn't introduce any new new reducibles in the decomposition. Okay. So that seems to be. So these two different ways of thinking about it are the same. They give okay. the same okay. Okay. So it's except that this Borel picture has this additional. Uh, Information that you lose when you go to GLN, which is the tau j's. Is what, uh, ah, correct. Okay. Narsimha Chari was asking. So this, no. these tau j's are gone now. Mm. Once you go to GLN, you only remember the gammas. Okay. Okay. Right? okay. But if you stay in the Borel picture, you also have technically some finer information of the tau. Okay. Okay. Uh, Vishwanath. Yeah. So if in this theorem, I mean, if you take a generalized demerger module, uh, in which theorem? The, Uh, in this uh, Joseph theorem, excellent field ah. question. Ah. Uh, is there a notion for the generalized Demerger model? So generalized uh, Demerger. Uh, 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 yeah. So for me, it's uh, different because uh, it's the the cohomology and Bart-Simonson varieties. Um, uh, maybe it, um, it's the same same as uh, your definition, generalized Demerger model. So that is usually you take. Uh, so there are many factors. Is that uh, how you think of it? I mean, not just twofold, but uh, it's a sum yes, of yeah, multiple, many, yeah, many yeah, multiple tensor. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the thing, so the, uh, this excellent filtration, this path models paper by Lakshman by Gupta uh, and Magyar actually mm -hmm. works in that generality. They actually oh, yes. take yes, multiple exactly. yeah. multiple tensor products and, yes. and yeah. do it. So, so I suppose it probably there is a version there. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I, I don't. In the, actually, in that paper, they prove that this actually forms a basis. I mean, this kind of tensors. Right. Uh, but they have not talked about uh, this uh, uh, Joseph uh, filtration. I mean, this excellent filtration. Uh, I, oh, there. Okay. I see. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know. Okay, and I have one more question. So what happens to other types? I mean, uh, you are talking about only GLN, right? So, this, uh, yeah. So think? this, I mean, uh, uh, everything I've said until this very last thing. So other, other than saturation, everything yeah. before this slide is, of course, in general, all of the same stuff works. Uh, yeah. uh, even for Katsumuri algebras, etc. But you know, Joseph's results are very, very general. Mm -hmm. uh, so until this point, everything is uh, all types. It's uh, it's only when we get to saturation that we really have to start thinking about type A because uh, there one doesn't quite know what the uh, in you know, saturation other types uh, is not uh, we don't quite know what happens in that. Yeah. So that's the reason for the restriction to type. A. Okay, and and uh, if if you take uh, uh, your second next question, W or refined filtration. But uh, yes. this, uh, I mean, uh, you can ask for the generalized Demerger module also, right? Uh, sorry, which question? Uh, it's the same saturation question. We are taking that V lambda tensor uh, 
uh, uh, v sigma mu. No, right? but then there will be multiple tensor products, no? Uh, you probably... No, but here yes, but here you take a v lambda tensor, the generalized Demersen module. No, generalized Demersen module still that is uh, Borel module. No? Here he is considering UG module. So. I uh, know, but in the Joseph filtration, he has taken only a uh, Demersen module, right? Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, can we ask uh, like a similar saturation question for generalized Demersen module? Or is it make sense? Uh, what is the... So you want to define some coefficients which are Okay, so it's some sort of multiple. Um, so it's not like a it's C a lambda product. mu nu. You'll have C lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, whatever. Yeah, lambda. exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I have to think about it. Uh, yeah, I don't know offhand. Okay. How? But if these generalized MSUs somehow uh, give you a filtration of this multiple tensor product. Yeah, but, but still the, the filters have very nice way like this, because here again, these are the demersion modules, right? I mean, do you get a filtration again by generalized demersion modules? If uh, you're asking me whether you get uh, filtration in terms of uh, generalized demersions? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I I have to check. I okay. think Little Man, um, this LLM paper has some some stuff in general, but I forget whether you know, this um, see this this result this final thing we are using they only prove for two. Um, okay. The, the initial part of their paper has stuff for mm -hmm. multiple multiple tensor products and generally stems and so. Yeah, uh, I really don't know. Yeah, that that would probably be interesting. I mean, what what you're asking is probably an interesting uh, question. You, know, you have a nice filtration for uh, multiple tensor products, and one might be able to define these coefficients. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So this uh, W refined LR coefficients again. Uh, 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 so does it count some um, points in some polytope like that? So <laughs> yes, yes, yes. That's that's exactly how. Yeah, that that's what we'll uh, do next. Time. So the the hive polytope is what um, uh, Knudsen and Tau use to um, prove their saturation temperature, and that is by showing that this number is the number of uh, integral points in in the hive polytope, mm -hmm. and uh, so if you put a sigma into this, then what you get is really some face of the hyper or some union of faces of the hyper in general. Uh, faces are some kind of a sliding, I mean, some kind of a cut. Uh, that, yeah, so by faces, that's what I mean. So, uh, I mean, the high polytopes are, generate, are uh, defined by a collection of inequalities. Right? Yeah. And you make some of the inequalities as equalities. Uh, okay, okay. So the polytope yeah. itself is defined like that. You, you have a collection of inequalities. And so some of those inequalities are, are made into equalities. Once you make equalities will depend on the sigma that you use. No, no, either you get exactly a face of a polytope or it's kind of a, uh, some kind of hyperplane section with, uh, with this polytope. Yeah, you get a face, right? You get a face because you set some things to equality. Yeah, some to equality. So the polytope is on entirely on one side of that. Uh, of that. Okay. Okay. I mean, it because doesn't cut it transversely. For example, it's it's sort of it's entirely on, in one half space. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because in general, uh, uh, these uh, Nukanukanko bodies they cut in not in a face but they cut in a like a some kind of section. Like take the polytope and then cut the section. Transversely, you mean sort of goes through the middle of the polytope. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. These are all faces. Okay. These smaller dimensions. Yeah. Smaller dimensions. Yeah. 
so that's that's the that's the eventual idea so the point is in general you can get a union of faces when for a given sigma when m is huge somehow correspond to taking the union of faces of the whole group yeah. uh, but the special 2 uh, and 3 and i'm sorry 2 3 1 and 3 when to avoid permutations you only get a single face these are the guys for which it's it's a it's a single face yeah 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 actually these uh, uh, 312 has also some nice property i mm. mean like if you take a uh, toric degeneration of uh, flag variety uh, in the, in the in the i mean let, let's say it's in the given by lakshmi bai and the other right so actually this uh, 312 phase actually if you restrict to your uh, degeneration to the schubert variety mm-hmm. that it actually gives uh, toric degeneration So this is some, no. something they call Kemp uh, Kemp varieties or Kemp. Ah uh, no, not not Kemp varieties, but it's uh, if you take the toric degeneration of flag variety, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. then uh, you can ask the question uh, which Schubert varieties are gives again a toric degeneration. So in general, what happens is uh, they might be union of uh, toric degeneration. Ah, okay, okay, okay. So that is called semi-toric degeneration. Okay. but if you, your permutation avoids 312 mm-hmm. then actually it gives a one phase in the polytope so that means it gives uh, toric degeneration so your restriction of toric degeneration is giving a uh, toric degeneration that so, that is precisely that is precisely how it it appears in your program. so this is some, this work of kogan and Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Kogan, the these are called Kogan faces. Kogan mm-hmm. faces, right? Yeah. Absolutely. So that is exactly what we use. So three one two and two three one. So two three one is just the conjugate of three one two by the longest term. So yeah, it's, it's like opposite Schubert variety. It's the opposite Schubert variety. Yes, exactly. exactly. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's enough to prove it for one or the other. Yes. And, uh, uh, okay. So the three one two case is um, so there is a single Kogan face which corresponds. Exactly. To exactly. Exactly. And so then it also turns out that uh, somehow that particular Kogan face has this nice, uh, um, you know, property that you know which equalities, which which inequalities are made into equalities, are it's exactly the right collection of equalities and the inequalities ah, okay. which makes this Knudsen and Tau's proof work as well. So if you just follow their their argument, mm-hmm. it, it, this Kogan thing somehow is exactly meant for that. So this three one two. Um, avoiding permutations, they give you exactly yeah. the configuration which allows you to, you know, more or less write down Knudsen and Tau's proof. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. In fact, in in Kogan's paper, uh, he has given uh, an algorithm how to write these Kogan faces. If you give given a W, right. then you can write the Kogan faces. So. Right. In terms of yeah, you, you, there is one special thing, and then the rest are all some ladder moves. And, yeah, some yeah ladder movement, ladder yeah, moves, or some ladder sliding moves, or something. Yeah, yeah. So this three one two will not have any ladder moves. There is just a yes, single. Exactly. Yeah. So, so that's why it's sort of uh, left justified or whatever. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. That's why it gives the unique face in in the in the you are talking the in the, in the, the right. palette. Okay. So, right. So it has some geometric meaning. So. Right. 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 <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. So. No, no. That and that is exactly what. What is in there? So at the end of the day, that's exactly what. Okay. Once you show it's a face, is saturation automatic or? Uh... No, no, no. So uh, also the fact that the face, so a face eventually means you must make a certain collection of um, um, inequalities and inequalities. Yeah. So you need a certain. Sort of precise um, configuration of of faces. So this is what uh, Chari just said. If, see, if, if Kogan okay. has so a certain algorithm, he says, if you so if you have one, there is a particular kind of face, and then so in general, I said there is a union. In that union, one face is somehow distinguished, and from that face, you can get all the others by applying something called a ladder move. I see. But these three one two avoiding guys are the ones which are sort of all the way to the end. They are left justified, um, so that there's no wiggle room for me. You can't push them any further. So it is that kind of face uh, which allows for saturation, that proof to be copied. If your uh, thing, the the collection of equalities okay. was, sort of, was sort of bang in the middle of the hype diagram, rather than being kind of left justified. 
no left and bottom justify that is more or less the, the configuration one needs if it's anything else so you would always get a face but this avoidance give you these nice faces for which you get in general you get a union of faces union of faces, union of faces. Yeah. you get a union of faces this avoidance gives you a single face single but a face. single face which is somehow for which the equalities are left and bottom justify that's broadly the norm if it gave so you a single face which are sort of sticking out right in the middle of that height diagram then you couldn't actually run uh, notion and tau square so you also okay. need this additional thing but i mean when it is unique when it gives you a single face it also gives you the single face with these nice properties so. ah okay i see yes so i suppose we'll see that next time yeah yeah okay uh, any more okay. questions okay no, just, no one questions? Ah, yeah. just one clarification okay. just one clear yeah yeah so when you say your uh, uh, the sn thing is just from the crystal graph right and the uh, sn action take the yes. crystal graph and just apply the sigma and go to that sigma. end of that uh, yes. apply a simple reflection go to the end of that uh, and pick up that and yes. that and when you are saying you are completing it with uh, Uh, when you are calculating the Demazur module, you are also allowed some intermediate fellows that you pick up on the way, based uh, on your reduced expression. Is that uh, how I am going to collect it? Uh, uh, so that collection is slightly more, slightly is more okay. subtle than that. So, oh, okay. for example, uh-huh. see if you only thought of it in that way, you uh-huh. wouldn't. Uh, so this guy, for example, uh-huh. sort uh-huh. of sticks out, right? See, because the reduced expression says, see, I I am start out at this guy, uh-huh. and then I apply an S two. and then uh, s1 correct i mean that's the path i take to get to this uh, this yellow guy correct right but then the demesure uh, module also the demesure crystal also includes this one additional fellow here ah which is somehow not uh, i mean it's not the things you pick up on the way somehow right when you apply the uh, no module. so when since you are allowed to apply uh, you write down this reduced expression and you are allowed to apply up to the power right that's yes. uh, uh, no no up to uh, no any power is okay any power uh, any power in that order in that order okay in that order, in that order. okay so and this f1 you get by a first applying the zeroth power of f2 to the highest guy okay. followed by the first power of f1 okay 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 right so in general you are allowed to apply any power of f2 followed Correct. by some power of f1 so here Correct. we choose zero and one and that okay. gives you this additional power. Okay. But, okay. Okay. But after some power, it will be zero. I mean, like it's only finite. Yes. Yes. Yeah. There, it's anyway finite. Yes. Okay. 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 I mean, another way of saying it is, if you started with this extremal guy and you just applied E I to it, I mean the Demazur module point of view, which is you start with an extremal weight vector and you apply it, it's the B module generated. Correct. Right? Correct. That does that breaks down in the crystal point of view. Meaning, if you started out with this extremal fellow and decided to only apply E I to it and see what you would get. In this case, it will only give you these these four, you know, the correct. ones these, along this path. Correct, correct, correct. You will miss out that additional fellow on that. Correct, correct. So some of this Demazur crystal is subtler than than that. Oh, it okay. seems subtle. Some of the definition it has to be made in this way. Yes, you oh. must apply that string of f's in the same order. So no, that mm. that somehow the key. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Please. Okay, so uh, any more? So I had a, uh, um, a remark. Sure, go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, in uh, rep- uh, sort of response to what uh, Chari and uh, Arsima Chari and uh, KV were asking, I uh, maybe the, there is what they are looking for may be found in a in Kumar's paper, possibly. Uh, uh, Shravan Kumar's. Yeah, uh-huh. I'm. I'm trying to desperately look for the correct statement. I'm not able to find it, but surely it will appeal to their uh, 
So for example, the, uh, what you would want is, uh, um, so everything interpreted as sections on some sugar variety or variety. Mm. Uh, so that, that much is definitely there. In, in Kumar. In Kumar, yeah. So that would be a place to look. I'm, uh, I'm looking through the paper, but I'm unable to find the, you know, the one that flinches, that would flinch their, uh, that, that would give the correct answer to their question, but uh, uh, that I'm unable to find. Uh, but uh, it, yeah, it, yeah. definitely uh, it is something to look at. That's all I want to say. Okay, now, just one more before we leave. So this module that you circled and showed just now, it is really, if I start with uh, this highest weight and I uh, just look at the Schubert variety corresponding to uh, which was S2, S1, S2, S1, S2, yeah. S1, S2. it yeah. is, uh, it is, uh, it, these are really the weights that will occur in the uh, cohomology of the Schubert variety. That is correct, no? Uh, oh, so the, 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 the guy. Yes, this uh, whatever on your on the current yes. what is S1, yeah? S2. Correct. If I look at S1, S2, I mean I can yes. start with this highest weight, yeah. uh, this character, namely uh, whatever uh, two ones and uh, this whatever two one, the two one mm. shape, mm. and I apply uh, first. I'm sorry, I suppose you will start it from the left or the right. I mean I am always confused about that. But yeah, you will apply. If I apply, I am allowed to apply. Uh, uh, FIs, mm. F1s, either zero times or as many times as I want, then mm. I have to apply F2s in that order and to whatever is left with the collection of tableaus that I get, mm. I can apply uh, F2s. So I'm allowed, uh, so, the, so the character that you will get is precise. The, so this, uh, these four, these five uh, weights mm. that you get are precisely the cohomology of that Module, right? Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just clarify. Just... Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, very nice. So, any more questions? Right. So, if not, let's thank Vishwanath again. Now that we've recorded ourselves thanking him, I'll stop recording. <laughs> okay.